Hi, my name is Lisa Brody, and everybody watches AccessTV.org. Peace. Can you hear me? Welcome, and thank you for attending this evening's program. This uh, program is a part of a series of programs and events centered around this past October's One Book, One Hartford selection, A Wreath for Emmett Till, originally scheduled for uh, late October and due to, uh, I believe it was Hurricane Sandy. We had to postpone this and uh, this program uh, was scheduled for this evening. For those of you who are not one Book, One Hartford builds community around the shared experience of people reading and talking about a single book. For the last 10 years, One Book has created an awareness of the importance of reading and literature, as well as exposure to new thoughts, ideas, and realities. Aretha Emmett Till is a sophisticated and thought-provoking poem written by Connecticut's Poet Gloria and award-winning poet Marilyn Nelson. The book combines emotion, history, and social commentary to bring the life and death of Emmett Lewis Till back to our nation's consciousness. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old African-American boy murdered in 1955 in Mississippi for allegedly whistling at or speaking to a white woman. With beautiful language that turns chilling at times, Nelson asked readers to face the atrocity of lynching and its role in our nation's history. Her poem calls readers to bear witness and speak out against such hatred and violence. Aretha Emmett Till invites readers to explore its layers for meaning, symbolism, and connections between past, present, and future. This evening's discussion, Where Are We Now?, will explore the past, present, and future of the civil rights movement, more specifically, how much progress America has made since this tragedy. We have brought together a group of panelists for this evening's program. The program will be moderated by Anne Marie Adams, editor and publisher of the Hartford Guardian. Dr. Adams is the founder of the Hartford Guardian, an award-winning hyper-local news magazine created in 2004, a nonprofit news website. The Hartford Guardian went live in October of 2008. The Guardian has been featured in several publications, including the February 2012 issue of Hartford Magazine. Dr. Adams is the 2011-2012 Race and Gender Postdoctoral Fellow at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, and also is a race and education contributor for the Washington Post. Before defending her dissertation and graduating with distinction from Howard University in December of 2010, Dr. Adams worked as an education and government reporter for the Hartford Current, Times Herald Record, Norwich Bulletin, Fox News, NBC News 4, and other regional, national, and international news outlets. Dr. Adams has received numerous fellowships from investigative editors and reporters, Poitner Institute, the Casey Journalism Center, and the Hechinger <coughs> Institute at Columbia University to pursue reporting and writing about social and educational issues. She has also earned it at a 40 Under 40 Award for the Hartford, from the Hartford Business Journal and is currently writing a book centered on the long civil rights struggle by blacks in Connecticut and its essential component of quality education. Thank you for coming and please help me welcome Dr. Adams. That's your honor. Hello and welcome again. As he said, my name is Anne Marie Adams. I'm the founder of the Hartford Guardian, and we've been building community through civic journalism for eight years. And this discussion is also a part of that uh, mission. So we're going to get right into the panel discussion. I'm going to start by just uh, introducing the panelists, and they can hold their hands up, and I'll they'll nod, and we'll go forward. Mohammed Ansari, he's president of the Greater Hartford NAACP branch. He was recently nominated to serve two more years with no opposition. Mr. Ansari worked for the Open Heart as the executive director after working there for 20 years. He retired in 2010. 
He serves on the board of directors of the Open Heart Association, and Mr. Ansari serves as the resident imam of the New Africa Learning Center, which is a small Islamic religious community in the city of Hartford. A resident of imam is similar to a pastor of a church. Mr. Ansari, could you just wave your, put your hand up? Okay, and then next we have Reverend Stephen Camp. He's a senior pastor faith of Faith Congregational Church. After attending undergrad school at Bethune-Cookman College and the seminary at Chicago Theological Seminary, he served as pastor of Dayton, Ohio and Chicago, Illinois for almost 20 years. He became the associate executive minister in the national setting of the United Church in Christ from 2000 to 2002. He served as conference minister and executive for the Southern Conference United Church of Christ in Greensboro, North Carolina from 2002 to 2009. Reverend Camp, could you raise your hand so the audience can know who you are? In December of 2009, Reverend Camp was called to become the senior pastor of Faith Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, Hartford. This is also the church of his formative years and early faith development. Next, we have Yusuf Cordillas, who doesn't have a bio, but I'm sure he'll tell us all about himself. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Jeffrey Ogbar. Dr. Ogbar is the Chief Diversity Officer for the University of Connecticut. His duties include advancing university-wide efforts, to recruit, develop, retain, and engage a diverse team of faculty, staff, and students with varied backgrounds and perspectives. These duties also include advising the president and provost on diversity policies, initiatives, and issues including, but not limit to, limited to, public engagement and strategic plans related to various university constituencies. Prior to his role, Dr. Agbar served as Associate Dean for the Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences in 2009 to 2012, and Director of the Institute for African American Studies 2003-2009. He is the author of Black Power, Radical Politics and African American Identity, and a winner of an outstanding academic title from Choice in 2005. He was also the editor of Civil Rights, Problems in American Civilization, and his book, Hip Hop Revolution, The Culture of Politics of Rap, was published in fall 2007. It is a winner of the W.E.B. Du Bois Book Prize from the Northeast Black Studies Association in 2008. <coughs> His most recent book, The Harlem Renaissance Revisited, Politics, Arts, and Letters, an edited volume, was published in 2010 by the Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, Dr. Algor. Then we have Sandra Staub. She has been a legal director of the ACLUCT since 2010. Her pre previously, Sandy was chief of the Dom domestic violence Prosecution Unit for Northwestern District, the Attorney's Office in Northampton, Massachusetts, and a partner at Buckley, Richardson, and Jolinas, the largest firm in Western Massachusetts, and a partner at Allison and Angier and Bartman, a small firm in Hamner, Amherst, Massachusetts. Sandy also volunteered as a board member as the president of NELCWIT. A long acronym, I'm sure she'll tell us what that means. And it's also an agency provider providing shelter and services to women and children transitioning from violent homes as a trustee of Greenfield Community College and as a distribution member of the Western Massachusetts Community Foundation. Sandy graduated from Greenfield, Greenfield Community College and Amherst College and Yale Law School. Could you please welcome our panelists with a round of applause. Okay. I want to start by asking our panelists
was just to uh, give an overview of the first questions I'm going to ask. They have a minute and 30 seconds to respond. After that, we'll have a conversation and then we'll have Q&A. And then we'll take questions from the audience. So I want to talk, uh, start with Dr. Ogbar. And let me know if I'm saying that correctly. You can correct me if I'm Ogbar. Ogbar. Okay. So Ms. Dr. Ogbar, as a community of people with shared American values, what is the meaning and significance of Emmett Till to you? I think that um, the Emmett Till murder in many ways is a sort of a, it's horrifying and it's, um, it's, it's, like it's horrifying at different levels. It's, it's horrifying because of the sort of flagrant, you know, sort of disregard for this human life, but also uh, in the sort of brazen way in which it unfolds in front of some sort, of sort of public spectacle where it gets national attention. This is 1955, October, so well from uh, August. He's murdered in August, and so you have this until October verdict, but you have you know, an, an, an international spotlight, actually. You have the press outside of the United States uh, witnessing this, and it's in the middle of the Cold War, so even with this sort of uh, media attention, there's absolute disregard and fear of any sort of uh, that they could, in fact, murder a child with impunity, and it happens with an all-white male jury. They don't even allow white women to be in jury in Money, Mississippi. So you have uh, it's such a bold, flagrant, and it's frightening in many ways that people have such a uh, little power to, in fact, connect or, or expect uh, justice. So it becomes a catalyst for the civil rights movement. Of course, later that, that year, we have the beginning of the Montgomery Bus Boycott, and you have this sort of grassroots mass movement, but you have an entire generation of people who are inspired by this hill. Nelson being one of his children who see this and of course are, 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 are horrified this, in the same sense emboldened by uh, the energy that they see around them to challenge the system of white supremacy. So in many ways it becomes a sort of you know, landmark when you think about the Brown vs. Board ruling, when we're going to be the most boycott, this becomes an essential part to the, the sort of foundation uh, to the modern civil rights movement. So it's really important in just shaping the, the national character. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Mohammed Ansari, what, is, what does the Emmett Till murder mean to you, and what should it mean to us? Well, yeah, during uh, that time, I was in the service, and um, uh, I was 18 years old, I guess, returned from and I was stationed in uh, uh, North Beach, South Carolina, and it, it just uh, reminded me, you know, of the time that that, that we were living in uh, during that, that period of time, where there was a tremendous amount of, uh, especially in the South, a lot of hatred towards. Uh, African Americans, people of color, and at that time we were pretty much the, uh, uh, the only group here uh, of color and, uh, back in the 50s. And, um, and this uh, the kind of uh, hatred uh, that, that was expressed in that horrific event towards uh, another, another human being, which happened to be a 14 year old. Child, I mean, it uh, really was uh, unbelievable to some people, uh, but uh, not to those of us who were living uh, here in America and, and in the South uh, during that period of time. Uh, and uh, you know, there was a lot of fear, and uh, people lived with fear. Just because of who they were, uh, uh, and, and 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 to know that at any time your life could be taken, and uh, and and nothing or very little uh, would be done about it. Uh, but there were uh, groups like uh, Dr. King, and uh, you had on the other side uh, Malcolm X, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you know, who were fighting the system to bring about uh, change, uh, which was def definitely needed. 
And uh, I think if we can learn from uh, what happened during that era, uh, we should be careful not to uh, allow ourselves to drift back into uh, mistreating someone, maybe not to that extent, but just to deny someone uh, rights, uh, uh, equal rights, same rights that I want, the same opportunity that I want, you want, simply because of uh, who they are. I think that uh, we should learn from that, uh, what happened then to, to a young boy, simply because he supposedly whispered at a, at a female, but he things that a young kid would do, uh, which you would think nothing of it today if it happened. So, uh, right. And Mr. and Sir, I want to thank you for that. We're going to pick up on that when we, we get to the other, after we get to the other panelists. And I want uh, Reverend Camp to follow up on that with the same question. Well, for me, I, I guess that, that I would just simply say that freedom is not free. And uh, we, we have all kinds of instant instances in our history, in our common history, as well as in African American history in this country, or Africans in America in this country, where where we see that violence and, and all kinds of uh, wrongs have been done. It's the reality that we have to live with every single day. I think the church was mobilized. I think the church uh, had a sense that a wrong had been done, but. Uh, uh, institutions will move slowly. Uh, people uh, have to go through processes to get to justice, but justice will not be denied. Uh, we're still in that struggle, in my estimation. Thank you so much, and we'll move to Mr. Codalis. 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 Great. Could you just tell us a few things about yourself before you begin?
philosophy of trying to find justice worked didn't work because of the color of his skin. And it's a reminder to me of the work that needs to be done here in Connecticut in respect to uh, the, the racial disparities in terms of the entry level to the criminal justice system, the way more people of color are stopped for traffic violations than white people, more uh, proportionate to the population, more people of color are searched than white people, so that you get a disproportionate number of people brought into the system. And when you flip that and you're a victim of a crime, um, you know, to the all ends of justice, there's studies on this, particularly on the death penalty, the way it was meted out in Connecticut. If you were a victim of murder, you know, the worst of the worst kind of crime, and you were a person of color, that person would not get the death penalty, the person who did this to you, but the person <coughs> who killed a white person would get the death penalty. Not necessarily actually executed, because we haven't done that in a long time here, but the statistics are there, they've been presented to the courts over and over again, and there is injustice in the application of the law, and, and the till is a reminder of of the worst outcome. Thank you, Attorney Staub. I, I see you have brought us into the present. Uh, William Faulkner said, the past is not dead and buried. In fact, the past isn't <coughs> the past. So I wanted you guys, the, the panelists, to just talk about the parallels of the Emmett Till murder and what's going on today with the Trayvon Martin case. Um, Reverend Camp, do you want to start with that, and then we'll go down the panel one by one? Well, I mean, racism, it, it's rare in all kinds of ways. And, and, and uh, at the root of both of those cases, I think, is racism. Um, at the root of both of those cases was a person who saw another human being and decided that person's fate went very negative. And a violent way, and uh, uh, while Trayvon Martin case is still one that is pending, it still uh, lifts up to America that we we have a long way to go, that we're not finished with the the aim of, of all citizens being treated with equality, treated with a sense of justice, uh, with a sense that that uh, one can interact in society without fear. So I would hope that uh, uh, we, we would get down the road of doing better than we have, but we are where we are. Thank you. Mr. Ansari? Uh, yes. <clears throat> you know, I agree with Reverend Count. Um, but I, I do have um, some hope in that um, I have seen uh, some changes uh, uh, in the um, in, in the hearts and the minds and the thinking of people, uh, especially young people, um, we still have some of the races around um, uh, who still um, think that uh, maybe one group is superior because of their color. But uh, at one time, that was that was the law of the land. I mean, it was like. Uh, the majority thought that way, and um, uh, today it's not it's not that way. We're finding the young people are changing and um, becoming more ex accepting uh, one another, and um, so there's hope. And, and, and um, you know, when we the uh, uh, Trayvon Martin case, when those type of events <coughs> uh, surface now. We have to deal with them and uh, and deal with them appropriately. And I think that uh, people on both sides now are beginning to speak out about uh, that kind of thing, which which gives some hope. But but yes, uh, racism is still here. But uh, the hope is that uh, more people now uh, are looking at it and, uh, and and fighting against it. Than it was back in the time of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. 
this, um, I got a chance this weekend to see this new documentary I believe they just came out, um, the Central Park Five, which is the, the famous, the infamous case of um, the, the brutal, you know, beating and, and rape of a jogger in Central Park on April 1989, and the five black and Latino males were arrested uh, for this. And uh, they, they served time, they were convicted, they served time for it, uh, and I think it was about 2000, that in 1989, I think it was around 2003, I believe it was 2003 when uh, DNA evidence, a guy in prison came out and said, actually, I'm the one that did it. It was just no DNA, they had all kinds of problems in the case, and all kinds of discrepancies, the boys all in jail. Uh, they were all teenagers, and they, um, they, they were released, it was wiped from their, their records after the person actually did the crime, they did to it, and he found Jesus in jail, and his DNA was actually the DNA found on his body. And it was a, uh, it, was, it was really kind of wild, but one of the things they, they said in the documentary, it was an incredibly well done documentary. I advise people to watch it if you want to see it. Uh, it's just, you, know, you might see it in uh, this uh, independent theater place out here in Harvard. The, um, someone, I think it was Calvin Butts in the documentary, who said that, and uh, had this been 1904, they just would have been, you know, just, you know, hanged from a tree. You know, all, all five of them would have been murdered. Probably others too, because actually a whole bunch of boys, they, they round up and, and they end up officially just getting these, these last five. Uh, so it probably would have been, you know, many people who have been murdered by a lynch mob without any kind of due process. And, you know, it was interesting that he went back to 1904, he could have moved up, you know, 50 years, uh, and, you know, Emmett Till in 1954, you know, to go back that far. He said that the legal system in many, many ways operated the same, they did as much as they could to realize the same thing within the confines of the law. And so in the case, they gave, they had the, the most harsh sentences were meted out, you know, for these, these, these uh, five uh, young men, despite these, you, know, you see how egregious the process was. You see the inconsistencies and everything else, and uh, testimony and recanted stories and all this. Uh, but what is kind of interesting about the, 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 the Trayvon Martin is that the, uh, you have a sort of, you have, you know, to, to go back to Faulkner's comment here, you know, I'm a historian and I, and I try to remind people that kind of like along the lines of what, what Faulkner is saying is that, um, you know, history is, is all around us. You know, that, that we're individuals that are consequence of our own you know, histories. You know, we see the world through a lens colored by our own personal experiences. And so collectively, people, you know, there's a sort of zeitgeist, if you will, so the spirit of the people that may be, in fact, shaped by you know, cases like uh, you know, the Central Park Five, and so, or cases like Emmett Till. And so people who weren't even you know, part of those generations, like this young man here in high school, there's a sense of sort of institutional structures and experiences that have you know railroaded and you know terrorized people and that, and that kind of thing. So to see the mobilization was actually surprising and fascinating, and actually I found very inspirational in the Trayvon Martin case to see young hip hop generation folks, people who are millennials, you're, you're this guy's age, people who are older, people who are much older, like my age, hip hop generations. But it was amazing to see how many people of different generations were out mobilized before through social media and everything else in different cities around the country. And so in this case. Unlike with Emmett Till, uh, or unlike the Scotch World Boys in the 1930s in Alabama, where nine boys went to, went to jail for life, eight of them were jailed for to be ex executed, and one for life. Uh, unlike those cases where you know uh, they they tend to be unsuccessful, and only through the exculpatory evidence uh, did the Central Park Five get out. In this case, the, the process is still pending, but inspirational in some respects. You know, so so I like to think of you know you know. You know, steps, not the steps aggressively as, as I, I think and, and, and uh, the opportunities um, you know, for justice to be as, as wide as they should be, but certainly not uh, Scottsboro, not my grandparents in Mississippi in the 40s and, and 50s, nor, uh, you know, uh, what we saw in uh, 1989 New York. But again, you know, this, this sort of, you know, process, as people want to say, the arc of freedom bends, the arc of history bends towards freedom or something like that. I'm always bad with quotes, but you guys can <laughs> Different 
agendas. Because it's kind of, we're in a, a conundrum. We have uh, the first African American president re elected when many people feared that he wouldn't be because of the white backlash we saw in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, explain that contradiction. What's going on here? Because, Reverend Camp, you said it hasn't really changed. Uh, Mr. Muhammad said it has changed. And so we have disagreement in the community about what has changed and what hasn't changed. So we can go to some, have some specificity here. What has changed and what hasn't changed? Well, I'm not going to argue with my brother here. He's <laughs> often more right than I am. But I, 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 would, say, I would say to you that, that coming up through in Hartford, growing up in this area, and, uh, and serving now the oldest black church, in Hartford Faith Congregations. Um, the church that was a part of the Amistad event, the first civil rights case in this country, that uh, it really uh, does show us today that there are, while they may not look the same, that animal acts the same. And I just think that we have to acknowledge that there is a reality that things are not all well in our country and in our world. And we have to acknowledge that there are ways that people are not treated as they ought in this society. And before we can fix it, we have to face it. And I think that we are trying to do that as a society. Yes, we've done some good things. We've elected an African American who is president, but it did not solve the race problem. Uh, it, he is running the country. He is not running black America. He's running all of America. And I just think that we just need to, uh, we just need to hear our, our, our young people when they say racism hurts and people are being hurt by the actions that are perpetrated upon other individuals. And so, yes, there are a lot of good things that go on. Uh, I, 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 very quickly, I happened to serve in my denomination, was the first African American to serve in the South, in the position of the leader in, for 300 churches in the South, most of them white. It had not happened before. But the fact of the matter is, when I walked in, racism met me at the door. And I fought through for, a few, for several years. 
it's, it's, it's a reality, and I'm just not going to say, because we live in 2012, that things are all okay. I, I want to stay with you, uh, Mr. Reverend Kent, because you did say the church was mobilized. Where is the church now, today? I do think that the church does work um, for justice still. Um, I think we've got a lot we need to be doing. I think the church, in some quarters of the church, when you say the church, it's a big, wide entity. But uh, those that are more progressive-minded have been beat up over the last 50 years. And I think we are trying our very best to find those centers where we can, we can impact and do uh, things that matter still. And I think there are ways that we are working for justice and we are trying to do good and positive things. We are trying to combat racism where we see it and feel it. Um, but, uh, you know, many might mainline churches are now on the sideline. <laughs> and that's just a reality in these days. But there still is a lot of good work out there happening. Okay. In your, di in your discussions, you talk about the collective we. And I want Dr. Obar to talk about this collective we. Who is this we uh, that fought the civil rights movement? Who were those people? Uh, yeah, the, uh, I guess there are multiple we's, of course, multiple communities, communities that fought for the movement, of course, and organized against the movement. And most people were on the sidelines, and most people were not activists. Uh, even black people in the states where the movement unfolded uh, were not, most black people were not activists. And so the, um, when you think about people who are sympathetic, people who are hostile, uh, most whites in Mississippi weren't out, you know, throwing brick bricks and bottles at uh, black people. Um, many of them may have been sympathetic to people throwing bricks and bottles at black people trying to get the right to vote. And certainly most whites in Mississippi who voted, voted for people who denied black people access to uh, democracy. Uh, and most black people in Mississippi. So, so we kind of think about these things are really kind of complicated when we think of people who are organized around these issues. I think that um, uh, certainly we think of even uh, like African Americans uh, throughout the country and then in white northerners who were increasingly sympathetic to the civil rights movement as, as top and on, but uh, indifferent for most of its history, if not hostile to it. So, I mean, I think that you, you think of things that are kind of changing, that, that are dynamic, and I think all of us would agree that uh, we're not where we want to be. I mean, I don't think anyone would say that, that, that everything is fine and we have no issues at all. Uh, but we certainly, and I'm, I'm very passionate about this as a historian, I mean, I hear it all the time. If I got nickel for every time, I'm going to say that we're worse off than you name the point in the past. Some people call me back to slavery, some people say civil rights, some people say some king was alive. Um, but the thing is, like, you know, to, to know this stuff, I was only born in 69, but again, uh, I mean, you can when you look at and what people, as uh, Mr. Ansari could, could testify, or even when people, how we people imagine that land size of black community back in the day, people, Bill Cosby, and a whole bunch of other people kind of make you think that black folks back in the day never did anything wrong. They never dropped out of high school. No one ever got pregnant before they got married. Crimes never happened. The word homicide didn't exist. And, and you never had slums, that kind of thing. Never had gangs. That's really not the world that people lived in. Right? You look at Hartford or Harlem or South Central LA or right where, and look at what, what black organizations said at that time and how they organized. I mean, they, they, like the NAACP and the Urban League did an annual report to the state of black America. They talked about squalor, disease, uh, dilapidated homes. They talked about ghettos and police brutality and not being able to, I mean, people with college degrees from Morehouse College who had to work as janitors at the Edna, I mean, at Edna in the Hartford, because you couldn't even be so let alone. So, so when you think about these spaces back then, I don't want to go back to those days. I don't want to go back to the days where my grandfather got beaten because my grandmother was light. And so, so that kind of romantic past is something that you know is just incredibly problematic, very dangerous. And in fact, the defenders, I'll say this real fast, the defenders of white supremacy in the 1950s, people like Strom Thurmond, right? Uh, Strom Thurmond argued, he's an explicit hostile white supremacist. He argued that the system of white supremacy was good because if we, in fact, allowed black people white to vote, if we allowed them to you know, go to our schools, that in fact you'll see a declension in the black community. There will be a sort of devolution you know, in the black community. That what we have is a paternalist relationship that actually benefits them and benefits us. And so, so un, although this is not our intention, whenever we romanticize the past, I know no one here is doing that, but whenever we romanticize the past, we, 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 it's a very problematic way in which we fall into this argument that in fact we were better off under an explicit system of white supremacy, which no one here in this room you know, would, would argue. And so, so there's no way we can get around the fact that we made progress. It's clearly a long way to go. And so multiple communities organized for, multiple communities organized against. I apologize for my next right. right. but, but that
that romanticism comes because of the lack of education about our history in this country. And that brings me to my next question for Mr. Cardulis. How, and Mr. Ansari, how is um, history being taught in schools today? Is it being taught in the Hartford Public Schools? Are people learning about the Civil Rights Movement, the nuances of the Civil Rights Movement? Mr. Cardulis. Now, they are teaching that, they are teaching it, but we're just not paying attention to it. <laughs> 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 I'm telling you the truth. Like we're not paying attention to it. I'm paying attention to it because that's our culture. That's our race. Like that interests me. Like I want to see what happened to us when when we came down here. Like watching all like watching Malcolm X and um, Martin Luther King, watching all those movies and reading and learning about it. That's something that gets me better as a Wow. Um, when I talk about the civil rights movement, most people think uh, in class, my students think it was fought only by black people. They call it the black freedom struggle. Um, and they segregate black quote unquote history from the rest of the American history. So Mr. Uh, Mohammed, I want to talk to you about this definition of African American. Some people have a narrow definition of what African American means. Uh, could you talk about where we are today? Because now we have more uh, immigrants in the cities, more black immigrants. And there's a discussion in the community about who fought the Civil Rights Movement and who didn't. Could you address that issue for us? Yes, uh, I'll try to do, <coughs> do the best I can. Uh, and I just want to just clear up uh, one thing, you know, so that it's clear. You know, I, I wasn't saying that, uh, you know, that there's no racism. You know, we still have it. Uh, I was only saying from my perspective, things are getting better. Uh, when you have, when you have now, you have, uh, you have whites who are speaking out uh, against it in numbers and um, in, in supporting uh, the effort to eliminate it. And I find that to be, uh, you know, hopeful. But uh, as far as uh, African American history being uh, taught, and we know that whites, but you know, was involved in uh, in, in the civil rights struggle. I mean, they, they there were whites who joined uh, with us during that time. Um, uh, there were a number of whites who traveled from the north to the south to participate in the, uh, the marches and whatnot, and uh, some even lost their lives as a result uh, of being involved. So it wasn't just African Americans who were uh, involved in the civil rights <coughs> struggle, uh, but there were other folks, uh, you know, even with the NACP, uh, it wasn't just you know, African Americans who started it, but it was uh, you know, whites and African Americans who uh, put the NACP together as an organization. So I mean, you know, whites have always played a part in the, um, the civil rights movement. Uh, I mean, you've always had some uh, Caucasians who uh, didn't approve of what was going on. It's just that at one time, the majority of them uh, uh, approved of it, or those who didn't approve uh, were silent and didn't speak out. Uh, where now it's changing, where you do have people speaking out now more than, uh, than before. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Obark, could you address that question? The definition of African Americans, who fought the Civil Rights Movement, and why is it important to make it known that uh, there was a multi-ethnic and multicultural and multinational coalition. If you could put it in context, in a global context as well, that would be great. Yeah, um, yeah. As, as Mr. Ansari said, you have, uh, of course, uh, non-African Americans. You have, you have whites who are involved in the 
the uh, the civil rights movement and, and whites who uh, been actually murdered uh, because of activism. You uh, and there were there were others, or Asian American activists and, uh, and Chicano and uh, the Latino activists who were involved in the SNCC and even more radical movements as 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 a Black freedom movement. Uh, you know, as Black power movement emerged, you, you have you know Chicano nationalists with brown berets and Puerto Rican nationalists with young lords and other groups. But you have um, in terms of international, this is something a lot of people, you know, some people may be more familiar with this, but the, as the civil rights movement unfolded, in the case of Emmett Till, for instance, you have international news attention, and you actually have people who are writing letters to President Eisenhower from France and other countries, imploring the president to, in fact, investigate and file charges against the murderers of Emmett Till. And the murderers actually, they, they come up and they come in uh, and look magazine, a national magazine, and admit to killing the boy uh, because of double jeopardy, they have no fear of going to prison. Charges of violating civil rights uh, could be, in fact, levied against him. And people asked, in fact, that NAACP went around the country with maybe, uh, uh, so, God, uh, they, uh, I forget her last name now, the, the maybe, I forget her last name, but his mother, they went around the country and they uh, collected uh, signatures and everything, but also international pressure was important. Eisenhower felt, you know, he said, well, sorry, too bad, you know, I'm not going to press charges against these white guys, and, you know, that's, things happen. You know, and so what it did was just, just sort of infuriate people, motivate people more, but you actually had international pressure that in this case, um, uh, the international pressure was unsuccessful. In a different case, called the famous kissing case in uh, North Carolina, it's a case with Robert F. Williams, who was a local president of the NAACP. In this case, you had two little boys, actually a group of little white and black children playing together, like around seven to eight years old. And uh, little white boys and black boys and white girls, they were all playing and stuff. And this little uh, uh, white girl sat on the little black boy's lap. Uh, Hanover Thompson was the little boy's name. And the white girl kissed him on the cheek. So she kissed him on the cheek. They kept playing, everything was fine. Gets back that the little sissy, sissy was a little girl, girl named Hutton or something like that. The little girl told her her mother. Her mother grabs her and literally washed her mouth out with soap. And the father, like, what's supposed to be on? She kissed a nigger. He gets a shotgun to go kill the boy, this little child, right? The mother, who's mad, but not thinking that they should murder the boy, though, she's like, well, maybe they could beat the boy or torture him or put him in jail, but to murder him might be a little much, maybe step on the line. And so she calls the police. The police actually go find the little boy. He's with another little boy. They catch the boy, and they get him before the father can go murder this little child. And the white, big, grown police officers catch the boy, the boys, throw him in jail. They beat these little children. And then the boys get sentenced by all white jury. They send their sentence to light to so their adults in prison for it, right? For sexual assaults of a white girl. International pressure. So Robert F. Williams mobilizes around the community. There was actually international pressure in the midst of the Cold War. People writing letters from Europe, people writing perhaps letters from Asia and, and Africa and Latin America, I don't know, but I certainly know the letters are coming in from Europe. And, and people said, the State Department said, Eisenhower, man, come on, you cannot <coughs> allow these sorts of draconian, savage, this, this gross miscarriage of justice and human rights violations to occur on your watch and pretend to be the leader of the so-called free world. I mean, I say somehow they call themselves the leaders of the free world. I mean, why? I mean, it just it clearly wasn't defensible, defensible right? But, but, but the pressures forced him to contact the government of North Carolina, to pressure, and then eventually the boys were released. But, but it was actually the international community in the middle of the Cold War that became, and, and, and the genius of uh, Robert Williams, who was a militant NAACP leader, who actually was armed. They, first, they created the first chapter of the NRA, the National Rifle Association in uh, Union County, North Carolina, an all black you know, chapter, uh, to defend, them against, defend themselves against terrorist attack. And so, anyway, it was really important in that case, international action. <laughs> Well, today Hartford has uh, West Indians, uh, Lat Latinos, Afro-Latinos, who are uh, trying to claim a space in Hartford. And what I find is that the nuance is left out of the civil rights movement. Maybe that's a class or a mind or something. But I have one more question, and then we'll turn to Q&A from the audience. I'm going to start with attorney stock. Given the mission of your work, of your organization, locally and nationally, what do you see as being barriers to full citizenship and access to all freedoms guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution? Well, well the, the short answer, well, under the law, people who are not citizens have constitutional rights in this country. Uh, but we find that that also is uh, not a law that, uh, that that set of laws is not enforced. 
So you have people, again, of color being uh, treated uh, less than favorably because they, you know, they have darker skin or they speak Spanish. Uh, and so if you ask uh, police departments, which we've done, we've surveyed, you know, whether somebody who is Latino can call the police and file a complaint about treatment. Um, and if they're not a citizen, that's okay, can they still file the complaint? And our survey says, you know, what are, are, you, are you not a citizen? You know, that's the first response from the police department, not, you know, what's the problem here? But they're legal residents? No, I'm saying that whether you're a legal resident or whether you're an illegal resident, you have constitutional rights. And so, and, and so that's the first answer to the question. And the second answer is, a lot of the efforts that are made by people who are interested in enforcing the immigration laws that do exist so that you don't have people in this country who are here, quote, illegally, end quote. Um, it, there, there, there's, there's not any way that I've found that, that, or I've seen, you know, that we've seen of enforcing those kinds of laws without um, profiling on the basis of race or ethnicity which is itself unlawful. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, given the mission and work of your organization locally and nationally, what do you see as being the barriers of full citizenship and access to all freedoms guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution? What do I see as barriers? Is that the question? To full citizenship, whatever that means to you. Barry, you know, it's, it's uh, again from, from, from the perspective of uh, the NAACP, it's, it's, it goes back to color, uh, ethnic group. Uh, you know, what 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 group uh, you belong to uh, becomes a barrier, uh, you know, um, and and uh, you have to fight hard to 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 acquire citizenship. Uh, if you're a person of color, then uh, and then and someone else, and and that I see is the um, yeah, is, is the major the major barrier. I mean, yeah, it's a it, it goes back to um, a, a racial thing by because unfortunately you have a lot of people who make decisions that are in power um, uh, happen to be racist. I feel. And uh, it, 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 and fortunately, a lot of the folks who are just common everyday people, uh, younger everyday people, uh, are not in that category. But they don't have the power to make the decisions that affect uh, uh, immigrants and and those who are who, who are in power. And that's who that's who the fight is is, is, is with. Uh, the folks who are in power, who have been there for years, and who still have the, uh, the, the racist, uh, I'm better, and uh, you know, white male type uh, thing is the best, and, uh, and 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 that attitude, and, and this is what this is what this is what a fight is, you know, <coughs> fight against that and replace those people uh, by polls and voting and uh, getting getting people and uh, voting people in office that have a different perspective. Thank you. Thank you. So color is a barrier. Reverend Camp? Well, I guess for me, I would simply say that uh, first class citizenship is a right, or should be in this country, uh, not a privilege. It should be that everybody should expect to have the same thing happen to them in terms of equal rights in this country. The fact of the matter is, I think one of the barriers is that people need a job. They need a living wage. They need to be able to support themselves and those they love. Um, we need, to, we need to, to figure out this justice system that wants to warehouse so many of our particularly black and brown males. We need to figure out uh, how, I'm glad this, this young brother is going to the, to the university, but so many young people can't afford it. Uh, they don't have access to what first-class citizenship is about. And until we do something about that and help uh, help people to to 
realize that their potentials, uh, all of us as citizens in this republic, uh, we are relegating some to uh, a, a more difficult struggle to, 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 to get the minimum and to get what is, should be first class uh, rights in this, in this society. So it, it is a struggle that, that is ongoing and one I hope that, that we all find ways to, to uh, impact. Mr. Cardulis. Um, I, I, I don't know this question, I'm sorry. What, what do you see as a barrier today for full citizenship to avoid uh, more pain inside, as you put it? More of that for, kind of pain. <laughs> for, yeah, young, we young kids need jobs and everyone else were like on the street who are begging for a job or begging for money. We all we need to help. We need to help them out some in some sort of way. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Doctor Obar. Uh, I like to kind of echo that. Um, I think the uh, I guess the the, the lawyer um, uh, Sandy could you know testify that in terms of um, the law. I mean we have law in place, and so there should be no question about uh, gradations of citizenship. But in, in terms of the, the realization of unfettered access to resources, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it's a very complicated issue, I can't put in sound by here, clearly education. We think of uh, the prison industrial complex. For me, I think the prison industrial complex and the so-called war on drugs, uh, those, those are perhaps the two most deleterious forces, I think, at work right now against um, certain communities of color. Uh, education, I think, is very, really important and, and essential. I think the responsibilities we bear with, you know, public school systems, teachers, parents, and students themselves, uh, a lot of different forces at work. Uh, so, you know, also having access to higher education was uh, very, very important. Thank you. We'll take questions and answers from the audience. Do we have our first? Yes, Joanne. Um, school choice was brought up as a topic, um, and from what I can see. Um, I, I have friends who, uh, one, one woman, her three of her grandchildren all were sent by their parents to suburban schools. Every single one of those children ended up transferring to Hartford schools because they felt like the teachers and the students were discriminating against them. They felt like they weren't learning anything about who they were and they wanted to come back to Hartford and be with kids who looked like them. And I'm wondering why there's all this emphasis on school choice instead of improving the schools that are already existing in the Hartford community. <laughs> Attorney Stone, do you want to take that? I think I would sort of want to answer that question and this question here, which is the emphasis I don't think is on school choice. I think the emphasis is on improving access to quality education and, whether, and, and that, that has not been achieved. Now, that's the first answer. The second answer is tying into President Obama. Uh, the answer is I think it's incumbent on us to raise the issue. And I'm not going to take credit for this example, but our history would be very different if then Barack Obama walking down the street in Harlem with maybe a little bit of marijuana in his pocket had been stopped by the police and searched, as they do, people of color, NYPD all the time, and he had been prosecuted and brought into the school to prison pipeline that existed in New York as it exists in Hartford. And this is the other part of the answer. We would have a very different history because he might not have been the person that we have as our leader today. But that, that's the exception, not the rule. That, tr that, 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 that going, going further is the exception, not the rule. And the barriers are huge. And the, the study we did on uh, this very issue, treatment of people of color when they go to West Hartford or when they go to Glastonbury, is in our report, School to Prison Pipeline, that we put out in 2009. It's not just some kind of uh, uh, mistreatment, racism, that, isn't, that you can't name. It is the kids who were being, you know, who were being educated in those schools were being disciplined more, were being sent to the criminal justice system more. It, it's, it's statistically, you know, evident in, in the materials relating to these kids. 
And so, in terms of what you can do, which I may have misunderstood your question, what you can do is keep compiling the information so that you can confront the people who are creating these educational systems and say, this is what we need. Because the, the numbers on the drug war, the numbers on uh, what's happening to these kids as they get brought into that criminal justice system, the way we lose them so that they can't go to a university, is, is, it is a crime. Right, and you have data. So let's drill down in that data because Barack Obama didn't grow up here. He grew up in Hawaii, which might be the reason why he wasn't stopped. <laughs> so what you're saying is if you are Mr. Cardulis's age, you can be stopped, right? You can be given a summons to go to court. You can get a prison record, right? If you miss that court date, you can be arrested, correct? There can be a warrant out for your arrest, correct? So let's just say we have 100 young black men like Mr. Cardulis, and I don't know, 75 of them are stopped and for some reason have a criminal record. What do you do, think that does to the city they grew up in? And how does it reflect in other institutions that are not reflecting people who come from the city? Can anyone speak to that and see how it radiates and how it impacts the community at large? Anyone from the audience or the panelists? If, if I could just uh, quickly, there, there have been a lot of studies done, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing your studies. Uh, there are a lot of studies done on the prison industrial complex and, and uh, Hip hop revolution. I have a chapter just just on the prison industrial complex and how it's explored and how it manifests itself. And and people have looked at communities like there was a study just on a certain neighborhood in Brooklyn and looked at the absence of men in this community. And then you can kind of go from there in terms of the destabilization of families, of households, of incomes, of people being able to pay bills, of all sorts of things. And then of course. We think of across the United States, uh, people were not allowed to, uh, to vote as a consequence, so you have uh, disenfranchisement uh, that occurs. Uh, you can't get school loans, of course, you can't get certain jobs, and so these, after people have come out and served their sentences and all these other things, they still don't have access. So legally, when we talk about this question about second class citizenship, I made reference to the prison industrial complex. Uh, the, the closest thing we have to a sort of institutionalized form of second class citizenship is how we treat people who have uh, been arrested even after they served their sentences they've been out still not being allowed to do things that citizens actually have uh, access to so that so so you have that by thousands upon thousands and hundreds of thousands and is just in terms of raw numbers the united states incarcerates more of the citizens than anywhere else in the world but just as a proportion i mean by far uh, the united states um, just so there's a ratio today no industrial addiction comes close and so you want to extrapolate and think about you know, I mean, all sorts of other ways in which communities are destabilized uh, by this, you know, and so the absentee fathers and all sorts of other things, too. So, um, I don't know how much that, that addresses yeah. some of these concerns, but yeah. yeah. Thank you. Another question? Well, uh, exaggerated numbers is one of the ways that the uh, prison industrial complex perpetuates itself. So, if like your number is 75 out of 100, yeah. that's more money, more police, more everything. And it just continues and continues and just continues to patch itself. Any more questions? Okay, we have three hands. We'll take you first, then Evelyn, and the lady at the start. Yeah, I would like to hear the panel talk about what you would, what would be your best hope? What would you most want to see in Hartford, Greater Hartford, in the next five years, ten years? Um, the big picture and some of the specifics <laughs> towards a, a more equitable arrangement between the races. Well, I'd like to see us put some emphasis and money, some, some energy and time with our young people, particularly our teenagers. Got too many of them killing each other, hurting each other, going to jail. We have too many of them that, that are not finished in high school. We've got, we just need to put some energy and time and money and resources to help them to develop. Uh, that includes parenting, helping, helping families. Uh, we have a young girl in our church who is, has been a part of the uh, DCF system all of her life. All of her life. She's been bounced from family to family to family. 
and, and uh, now is, is in an institutional setting. And it just, it's, it's heartbreaking what's happening to our young people out here. And we, and, and too often uh, we just kind of isolate the problem rather than try to face it and fix it. And so um, I, I would think that would be one thing that we could do, all of us together. Uh, but it takes a, a community will to make it right. So we need political will to spend more money on young people. Well, it's not as easy as that for me, but it is It is that the community needs to make some priority uh, that I don't think it has done with its young people. I, I, I must give a, a con, uh, one congratulation to our governor who, who tried to take a stab at education this last time. Um, and uh, he, he, in fact, uh, along with the black and brown, brown legislators came up with a bill that did eventually pass to try to deal with K through three. Uh, that's a step, but uh, there's so much more to do with our young people. We, we can help them to mature in ways that they are, are contributing members of society, but we have to have the will to do it. Thank you, Reverend Kent. We'll have one more panelist answer that question and then we'll go to the next. Audience question. Uh, I think that uh, just just real fast. I I, I don't want to underestimate the the daunting and deleterious effects of the prison industrial complex in Grenier and Hartford and Manhattan and Waterbury and uh, Bridgeport. I, I think that the the one of the first things would be how we uh, like criminalization of marijuana. I think that the decriminalization of marijuana is like really really, really important. And for somebody, I have a lot of friends that smoke weed. I don't smoke weed, but I'm like all about legalizing weed and marijuana. For all sorts of reasons, I can explain all sorts of reasons why I might be uh, you know, anomalous here in the room, but, but for all sorts of reasons, I think so. Um, I mean, the, the war against one of my favorite shows, Boardwalk Empire, you know, I might have a martini tonight you know, after this. Uh, you know, 80 some odd years ago, I might have got arrested for it, right? And it seems absurd now. And I think that I hope that five years from now, it might be absurd if I went out and got a joint and stuff. The idea of I'll be in prison for it just seems ridiculous to me. I can, you know, it's like for health reasons, I can, I can go to prison, I can go to, to a hospital for drinking too much tequila, I can smoke a pound of weed and I go not get sick, you know. So it just it doesn't make sense. So that's one big thing, and, 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 and most people who are actually arrested have been for nonviolent offenses in the so called war on drugs. And so these people aren't the folks who are breaking their homes and, and blending people or anything like that. So, so I think for that that one, that's a huge segment. Most people arrested in New York City last year were black and brown people for marijuana possession. Uh, yet, you know, again, so, so we're looking at this, and, and that's our first big thing. And I think that actually, um, I think there should be a public campaign, a really serious, hardcore public campaign. I don't know how to do this on parenting, serious, uh, systematic efforts about, I uh, mean, in, in the public school system, I mean, healthcare, parenting, a lot of the stuff, the studies we've done on homework, and a whole bunch of other things. It's not the time and place to get into great detail about that. But then a lot of studies about the efficacy of, of homework, how we think about this, but also in the house, and we think of, uh, of uh, education, and access to, to school through Pell Grants. There are all these things. Why, and I'm in the job of higher education, and we find it's very, very difficult for working class and poor uh, families. Even when they get a lot of aid, there, there's still a gap oftentimes. Even at the University of Connecticut, we have about a three to five thousand dollar gap in in, um, in how we provide aid for most of these students who've gotten into a great university who are doing well, but their families cannot provide that money. And even when it comes out to loans, sometimes because their parents require, they can't even get loans. And so, and so there's not even allowed to. So anyway, so I think that all these things are really, really important. Evelyn, next question. Um, I wanted to share a brief story. For the most part, when I talk to my children or, or um, some of the young children that I work with, and I mention the word race, they immediately associate it with racism. And it's always that the white person feels this way about us. And I remember when I was growing up about nine years old and I had just learned the uh, history of Emmett Till and civil rights and seeing my grandmother and my mother and everybody crying when Martin Luther King got shot. And I remember my father ended up bringing home a white woman. <laughs> and that didn't turn out well for me because I had just learned about slavery and Emmett Till and every, 
and everything. And I would guess that would have been my first time that I realized that I'd had advocacy skills because she tried to send us out to um, rake leaves in the backyard. And my first response was, there are no slaves in this house. And I told my sisters to go sit they butt down. <laughs> But that was something, the, my question um, that derives from that is, today I have a child that um, goes to school in Granby. She gets bussed out to Granby. And when they're teaching about slavery in her school, she feels ashamed. You know, she's like the one black kid in the room with about 20 other white kids. So she comes, comes home and she tells me how ashamed she feels. When I, you know, learned about slavery in the Harford school system, there wasn't any shame. There was like a, a righteous indignation that I felt towards it. Is there any strategic ways the school systems in the state of Connecticut are going to be able to address this topic so that students don't leave either mad at white people and want to kill everybody or they don't leave feeling like they did something wrong because their ancestors were slaves. Dr. O'Clark, that seems like a question for you. Just say real quickly, just very quickly, I would say that one of the, one of the clues to that answer is when those kids from Grammy start coming to Harvard Public Schools. I, I, you know, I try to explain to people that um, you're, not, you're not culpable, you know, you're not responsible for things that happen before you're born. You give, you're not responsible for it. Um, you know, I can't, I can't take, uh, you know, responsibility for my grandfather being a, a great mechanic, you know, uh, you know do much with cars. Um, and if he messed up, I can't take responsibility for my grandfather messing up. It just, it's really basic, and you just have to kind of explain that to folks uh, sometimes. One thing I would like to say is that she shared that the way that the teacher shared it with the class, the way it was taught, made her feel the shame. But maybe that's a question of the diversity of faculty or teachers in the classroom, perhaps? So that's where I say, is it ever going to be in a strategic approach? People that are teaching these classes to our children, they, I'm, I'm kind of feeling that they should have some type, they have some type of training and have guidelines on how do you teach us such a tender topic? How yeah, do you I, teach I think, that to children? I think that, that questions about pedagogy are issues that are universal. So, if, regardless of race of the teacher, the teacher should, of course, teach in an effect, effective manner that's you know, not going to humiliate anybody. Um, and, you know, so I, I can't, I don't, I don't know how, how it's being taught and that kind of thing. It sounds kind of wild, you know, but I'm sorry. Okay, we'll take the next question. Yeah, I have a multitude of questions. Um, one question. Then. Um, well, I, they're significant, and unless there's a lot, a lot of people coming from there's questions. one behind you, um, Yousef. You know, I don't have a son, but I'm very afraid for you as a black mother, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why. And you know, there's nothing wrong. I have friends, very good friends, that don't look like me, that are white and Latino, but for young boys of color, young men of color. Don't get too comfortable that everything is going to be wonderful for you, because it's not. When you get on an elevator, there will be women that will still be clutching their purses yep. because you're on there. Because your handsome is all get out, but guess what? You got locked and you're black. <laughs> so some people are still going to be afraid when they walk past you on the street that you possess a threat. And you can have all the degrees that you want. Some, some friends I have in Avon have been stopped, and they're attorneys. So I just don't want you to, I'm not saying that you should go out there and be this mad black man, but I am saying that you need to, you need to be, as my grandmother would say, when I was growing up, you got to be 10 times better, do more than what you're asked to do, and always be on the lookout because I don't want anything to happen to you. Um, for Reverend Camp, who's my pastor, and, and, and uh, Mr. Asari, As Asari, I don't think the black church nor the NAACP, both of them seem to be a little lame for me nowadays. Both institutions were just um, kicking butt and taking no prisoners back in the day, before I was even born. Things I heard about in, in, that my grandparents would tell me about, it was amazing. But we, we, we tended to, got, to have gotten a little laid back. Yeah, you know, Reverend Camp, our churches, we do a little bit, but we're so afraid that we're going to be militant. The NAACP used to be out there. To me, the NAACP, every time the legislature meets, y'all need to be in their face. 
because their Hartford is in dire need. Look at our neighborhoods. They're the pits. Okay, we need to hear more so from you. So perhaps you can ask so I'm asking, okay. what is your position? How are you guys going to come out, not you as individuals, because you can't do it by yourself, but how do you see both institutions uh, at least um, standing up and really being vigil and in, and in the face of America? Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I just think that, that folks need to claim our institutions that we have including, I can speak for the church, um, we, we fought hard over the last 50 years to, to, to make education a priority in our community, in our churches, and, and, and taught that the expectation was that you go to college. Folks, many took up that challenge and did go. And we have, we have very creative and, and uh, very fine resources today, but they, don't come back to church often. They don't come back and roll up their sleeves and they don't come back and say, hey, I'm here to help. I'm here to help strategize and, and I'm here to help bring my resources to, to bear. Uh, and so, so churches are having a colossal struggle just trying to, to, uh, to, to make ends meet, to, 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 to make a viable contribution in, in our communities. But we are still, I think, relevant, and we are still trying to, to do that. Um, the, the, the reality for me is that, that we, we just can't give up. And lots of folk want to say it, it doesn't matter anymore. And I just think we, we have a significant role in society still to play, the, the church, that is. And uh, uh, the last comment I would make to you, Wanda, is uh, churches of color, in my estimation, and this may be the most controversial thing I say today, but churches of color, in my uh, my estimation, still teach their young about race. Church, white churches still teach their young about racism, and there's a difference there. Um, and until we can get that turned around in the church, we're going to continue to have these kinds of colossal differences and. Uh, there's these wide divides that happen in organized religion. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Muhammad. Yeah, just to uh, you know, comment on, on which, <coughs> what you uh, you asked. Um, yeah, the NAACP. Uh, you, you may not see uh, us out there uh, marching, demonstrating. Uh, you know, as much as as it was before in the, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, but uh, we are involved. I mean, the racial profiling, um, it, it, that was when the legislature was meeting and, uh, and this was an issue, the NACP was there uh, pushing to get that bill uh, passed so that uh, uh, we come up with uh, a plan so that we could eliminate this racial profiling, and, 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 and that happened. The uh, death, uh, abolishing the uh, death penalty in Connecticut. Uh, the NACP was uh, uh, involved in that very strongly, along with the governor and uh, the uh, national uh, CEO and president, uh, uh, Benjamin Todd Jealous, came up and, and, and uh, met with the governor here when the press conference was made to. Uh, to, to, to state that the uh, death penalty has been abolished in Connecticut. Uh, the NACP was a part of that. The, um, uh, the brother who uh, was fired in New London, the fireman who went through the train, but they got rid of him. The only African-American fire, fireman who went through the train and then they didn't want him on the, uh, on the job, so they got rid of him. Uh, the NACP rallied the community and uh, we, we, we Met with uh, the folks at the training academy, and uh, and that was turned around. And brother got got his job back. I mean, uh, the MDC and Hartford, uh, who are not hiring uh, uh, people of color uh, to do this work, we've constantly been involved with 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 uh, MDC, uh, constantly fighting to try to get more of our people involved in getting contracts as well as getting jobs. The uh, police chief, Ravello, uh, we met with him when he uh, 
came in as, and, and made him aware of the Centron <coughs> decree and uh, what was he going to do as far as uh, his command staff. I mean, are there going to be any African Americans, uh, Latinos? And uh, he did tell me personally that he was going to uh, uh, work on making the police department reflect the makeup of the city. Recently, he did appoint two, uh, two folks to deputy chief. That just happened recently. We met with him in August uh, of this year. And uh, so we are involved. Uh, the NACP, it does things. Why negotiations? We have, committees, we have committees that, that are working, and we try to get things done and, and without making a lot of noise and whatnot if we can. If we can, then we'll go the other way. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Another question of David? Yes, my question is, um, what role does media actually play within the overall civil rights movement currently, as well as the question to you, Seth, if you can actually help out with this. Who are your um, mentors? Who are the folks that you admire that you're actually follow suit within the media to actually push forward? Um, to have me push forward would just be Martin Luther King and Malcolm X is one of the two. But the one who's like really pushing me forward is my uncle who passed like a long time ago. Like I inherited part of his name. So he's helping me push along with with my life. Even though I can't see him or talk to him, I, every time I look at to his pictures feels like I, he's living on like what I'm doing. He's living on inside me. Like I'm, I want to do more of my life. He did everything. He brought arts into our house. So that's something that's keeping me moving. Like I found dance, I found poetry. He found dance and rap and everything else. He brought that into our house. So he's keeping me moving forward right now. Thank you. And with that, we'll just have a last comment from all the panelists, starting with Attorney Staub. Yeah. Oh, we have one more question from the Chief. So we have to take that question. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank the panel. My name is Matt Poland. I'm the CEO of the library and also the chairman of the Hartford Board of Education. This is important. Um, uh, two comments. One, I wanted to thank you for a very, very thoughtful uh, panel tonight on this topic and how important it is for us to do more of this, uh, more of this work across our city and, and in fact across the nation. I think it's really important to use the public library uh, for this, this reason. You know, we are a, a non-political democratic place and we, we want people to come and talk about uh, these kinds of issues here so that we can make a difference together as a community. And so I thank you for tonight and thank you, Anne Marie. This is really, really a very powerful thing and I'm glad that, that uh, Mr. McCauley is taping it so that others will see it. I do want to, to, do want to suggest to people as they watch the chef, the progress of chef, um, and I'm talking now from the Board of Education's point of view, um, the, uh, the difference between youngsters who are brought here from outside uh, of Hartford and those that leave here to go to the suburbs is immense. And I think you probably all know that. Um, I was in a meeting the other day about this, the chef, further chef development that could cost the city $500 million in renovated buildings over the next few years. And the comment made by the state person was, um, well, we have to do these renovations of the, uh, of the schools or the white people won't come from the suburbs. And, you know, this is, this is yeah. getting more and more irritating as someone who was born here in Hartford to hear that we're going to build these schools and spend a lot of our own money in Hartford um, because we have to make sure the white people are satisfied coming here to our schools. And meanwhile, we fix the schools so the white people can come and we have schools that are falling apart, completely falling apart. 
for our own kids. So you look at Clark, you look at Burns, you look at Buckley, there are a number of schools where we should be and we, sh we are ashamed of ourselves uh, for allowing that to happen. So what's happened with the way, the way Chef has operated is yeah, there's been improvement. There are youngsters who are doing well in, uh, in integrated schools. We have some of the best schools in the country uh, now as a result of Chef. Uh, but we also have uh, uh, 12 of the 25 poorest performing schools in Connecticut yep. right here in Hartford. And Chef can't help those schools. Chef isn't helping those schools. Um, and we have to start thinking about how we're going to take action locally to fix the schools for the kids who are being left behind. And there are. It, uh, we all know that. Uh, we have, uh, we've been in reform for six years here, and we're still leaving behind thousands of children who are not having an improvement in their education. And until we can, can, until we can fix that, we really haven't accomplished much. And I think that for the white kids who come in from the suburbs to our schools, they're, you know, they're coming, they're coming together with 50% people of color, and their, their schools are good. They're, they're having a good time of it. But for this lady's children who go out to a suburban school where, you know, if one kid can go from here to a suburban school, it doesn't make sense, right? There's, there's no, it's not the same experience that the white youngster has when they come here, which is fully integrated. But it's not fully integrated in the, in the reverse. And I think that's where we have to really focus our attention on the education platform as we move forward. So those of you who are involved in CHEF, you know, CHEF is going through another iteration um, at the state capitol, and uh, I think it's important for our state to recognize where CHEF was great and where it's done great work, uh, but we can't leave behind uh, the rest of our youngsters who are going to grow up with, as, as uh, this woman said so eloquently before, always having to do better than everybody else because they're starting out behind, and uh, it's, it just has to stop. But again, thank you so much for uh, having this conversation here tonight. Great. Thank you for that update on Chef. Very important, my dissertation. Um, so we'll start with Attorney Staub, and we'll just give a closing statement. Um, I had the privilege in 1984 of taking a class with James Baldwin entitled Liter Literature and the Civil Rights Movement. And he espoused a theory that the reason why Malcolm X was killed when he was killed was because it was at a moment in his development where he uh, passed through several stages of defining the issue, including a race-based definition of the issue, which was, you know, to be with me, you have to be black. That was the, the beginning of his, his development, or sort of simplified version. And that when he made his pilgrimage to the Middle East, and he started believing that he could find a way to solve these issues uh, by reaching across uh, basically a class, it was a class issue that he was identifying. And again, this was controversial that James Baldwin was talking about this, but that that's the moment that he became the most powerful and that's also the moment that was the most dangerous for him. And so I'm leaving tonight taking inspiration from hearing from everybody on the panel and hoping that we can reach across these great divides and experiences and uh, move forward in a way that addresses racism and its ugly effects. This is the first time I actually done this, so thank you for letting me be here. And the racism, I hope this ha I hope this stops soon. Like, is starting to get a little far where since we're uh, our races is killing each other out, our younger races, we're passing before the older ones are. So. I don't think that should be happening. Even kids that are younger than just teenagers, like six or seven, are doing drug runs. Like, 
that's something that I caught and I don't think that's good. I, like, when I see that, it's killing me. The little kids, like, the parents are not, the parents are doing anything about it. Uh, if the parents are doing something about it, they have to, they have to tell them, not even tell them, like, force them to stop, because this is, because their life is not going to be good. Because I got, when I was in Weaver, I got stopped by some kid, like, my age, pulled a knife on me thought, he thought I had the weed in my bag, which the only things I had in there was my school supply and books and such. So he pulled a knife on me, so I ended up getting cut for it. And later on, he pulled out a gun on me on school grounds. And I'm glad he didn't pull the trigger and I'm glad I'm still here today to talk about what's happening now. But here, I'm going to get this up. We're glad you're still here today, yes. Dr. O'Connor. And I want to kind of echo what uh, Sandy and Yusuf have said. Uh, certainly, good to be up on the, the panel with everyone and share, share ideas on this. Um, you know, the, the Emmett Till case is you know, a very, very important case. I'm, I'm excited that the, the library and other institutions still uh, you know, keep alive. And Marilyn Nelson, this colleague of mine uh, in, in UConn, and it's, it's great to see her uh, being celebrated in this, this way. I think that um, in many ways, when we, to, to go back to your initial statement about Faulkner and the, the ways in which history sort of remain with us at all times, and this provides a very, very important sort of reference uh, for us. And then in many ways, you know, sort of exposes the monstrosity of much of Think of racial segregation, you know, the, the horrors of, of it all, but also provides um, context for our understanding of, of progress and resistance. And I like to always argue that that um, one level we should be intimidated by the possibilities even as we engage in the struggle. And so I want us to think that even when we are confronted with you know the Trayvon Martins or you know, 20 years ago or so with uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, Central Park Five case or uh, others, but there are activities, you know, over the generations, you know, have not been in vain. That somehow that that we have engaged in struggles, and these struggles have not borne other fruits. And I want to, to, as much as we continue to be engaged in struggles, I want to sort of think that we haven't made progress has been in vain. It just is, it does that sort of, I think, an injustice to the ancestors. So I like to think of and celebrate the successes that have been made, even as we continue to engage in struggles. So it makes it important in that context as well. Thank you. And I want to thank the, uh, you know, the library for inviting me in here to uh, to be a part of this panel uh, tonight. And um, you know, I want to say that you know I I met you know with Malcolm uh, he, uh, Malcolm X uh, on a number of occasions. I was inspired by him. I was a young uh, young man uh, during that time. And, and it was at a time when I felt that uh, uh, that whites and African Americans couldn't live uh, together here in America. That we would that we would never receive um, equality in America. Uh, and the only thing that uh, the only solution was to separate and um, and set up our own uh, thing. You know. Uh, Dr. King, on the other hand, was pushing integration and, um, and through both of those movements pushing, uh, change began to take place in America and, um, and, and laws began to change, amendments to different laws uh, came about and uh, voting rights and uh, uh, civil rights and uh, equal rights and uh, all of these laws uh, began to uh, uh, be made, uh, put on the books, but they had to be enforced. Enforced, forcing them was another thing. Uh, but then after a while, you know, they would be enforced. So the change, well, we can live in America, you know, um, and uh, we can uh, receive a sense of fairness in America. But uh, we have to fight for it, but we can fight within the system. Um, so, 
the, the ACP became more of a, a vehicle uh, to use to fight within the system, uh, fighting on different fronts, whether it's legal, having attorneys to go into the courts and fight, <coughs> or litigation, fighting to get laws changed and, uh, and make sure, you know, certain laws that, that, were, that were there, that they were changed, and uh, to, to make it more fair, more equal, or even demonstrating and marching and uh, protesting, boycotting and doing it that way. Uh, to bring about uh, fairness and uh, so that's where I'm at you know as far as uh, still trying to fight to uh, make it more equal more equitable society so that uh, all people uh, receive fairness receive justice uh, here in America we're not there yet so the fight is still on we're going to continue to fight and hopefully uh, you know, we try to recruit young people to come in and take our place and carry this fight on until things. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Uh, I want to echo the, the word of thanks to the library and to all of you. I appreciate being a part of this tonight. I think the, the thing that I would echo really all of what you have said is to say that I cannot and will not forget uh, in the till, but I also won't forget uh, Matthew Shepard, who was strung up to a fence, a young gay boy. I won't forget Bird, who was dragged by a truck. I won't forget Trayvon Martin, who was gunned down because he had some Skittles and iced tea. You know, we can't forget those kinds of moments. They're still happening in America. But I also would not want to leave here on just that note because the song is not yet all the way, it's not been played all the way out. We have elected a mayor who is a brown person here in this city. We do have the president of the council who is a black man. We do have a president is he a in member the White of your House. Church? Excuse me? Is he a member of your church too? One of them is. And, and the other is a member of the United Church of Christ, but that doesn't make a difference whether he's doing justice is my concern. And I am just, I'm lifted by and hopeful by those who, who are able and willing to step forward and to try as best we can to do justice. And there are many that are trying to do that, notwithstanding people who are here tonight. So keep pushing. I'm going to keep pushing for justice. And on that note, we'll end this formal presentation by the panelists. I just want to make a few announcements that to continue this kind of discussion, on January 24th, 2013, we'll be looking at the kind of pain Mr. Cardulis spoke of. And the title of that forum is Black Pain, Negotiating Health Disparities in the Black Community. January 24th, right in this room. So I hope you will join us. Please join me in giving the panelists a round of applause. Thank you. I'd like to ask everybody if you can uh, take a moment to fill out a survey that is available uh, in the back table here by the water and leave your surveys. Thank you all for coming.